Hi, my name is Jeff Klein, and I'm here today to give you a series of lectures, two lectures in particular, on neuroplasticity in the context of uh, neural rehabilitation. And it's always a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to uh, clinicians like yourselves, budding clinicians like yourselves, uh, because as a disclaimer, I'm not a clinician. I have no formal clinical training. I'm a basic scientist, but I'm interested in the fundamental biological properties that occur in the brain in response to normal learning events, as well as in response to what you might call relearning events, as in the response to um, rehabilitation. So the first lecture of the two that we're going to have uh, today is on uh, the science of neuroplasticity. Um, and in this lecture today, we're going to cover uh, the definition of neuroplasticity, the origin of a term. We're going to talk about uh, why neuroplasticity is important for uh, neural rehab. We're then going to talk about the behavioral and the neural signals that are related to uh, driving plasticity. And so the lecture today, The Science of Neuroplasticity, is supposed to lay the groundwork for the second lecture that you'll be getting, which will talk about um, how we apply the science in a clinical setting. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about, well, what's the actual evidence that if we all believe neuroplasticity is really the, neuro the neurobiological substrate for recovery or enhancement of, of function after injury or brain disease, uh, what's the actual evidence for it? Um, we're also then going to discuss the difference between recovery and compensation, both at a neural and a behavioral level. It's something I think that's really important uh, for occupational and phys physical therapists uh, alike to understand. Uh, we're then going to talk about which, what behavioral therapies that there are that are out there that drive uh, and do a good job of driving the behavioral signals that we know are important for uh, driving plasticity. And the final thing we're going to talk, or the other thing we'll talk about is uh, new therapies that are out there, what are called adjuvant therapies, that take advantage of what we know about the biology of the brain and the neurobiological underpinnings of plasticity in order to drive plasticity in the context of rehabilitation and enhance the impact that a therapist has on a patient. And finally, we're going to talk about a really new exciting field, which is the importance of what we call neurobiomarkers or biomarkers. Uh, things like residual tissue, location of damage, uh, genetics, etc., and how those things might inform therapists um, as we move the field forward. So to set the stage for all of this, um, I often like to show this slide and talk about the fact that over the last hundred years or so, we've enjoyed some fantastic uh, medical advances. Um, that is, we've had the invention of insulin, antibiotics, vaccinations for everything. Um, in my mind, one of the greatest medical advances that we've had in um, the last hundred years has been the mapping of the genome in 2002, which has led to an understanding of the genetic basis for a lot of diseases, and as you'll see in the next lecture, uh, also the genetic basis for responses to certain kinds of, of, of therapies. So uh, now if you look at all these great advances that are uh, here on the right side of your screen, um, one of the things you'll notice is that we haven't had any uh, significant breakthroughs, if you will, in the treatment of many neurological disorders. So we haven't had the equivalent of a vaccine for Parkinson's disease or a heart transplant for something like a stroke. So um, one of the questions then is why has the advances in the treatment of neurological disorders progressed so slowly as compared to other fields such as cardiology or uh, immunology, for example? Okay, so there are a number of answers, of course. Um, the brain in the central nervous system is a lot more complex than the heart or the immune, the immune system, for example. Uh, the second is that uh, over the last 100 years or so, um, the average life expectancy of people in the United States has gone from uh, 40 years old up to about 79 years old. So in fact, back in the year 1900, um, neurological disorders weren't that common, so you, people often did live long enough to develop Parkinson's or, or, or have, have a stroke, and if they did have a stroke, they probably weren't going to survive, or if they had a traumatic brain injury, they probably weren't, uh, weren't going to survive. The other is that if you look at all of those wonderful advances that we've made, so penicillin, insulin, etc., uh, they all have one thing in common, and that is they arose out of a collaboration between uh, basic scientists and clinical scientists. So the clinicians would say, here's the disease that we're having trouble solving, and the basic scientists would try and model that disease, and then work with the clinicians to try and come up with a treatment that could be then tested clinically. And up until about the last 25 years or so, uh, you know, we basic scientists 
as this diagram shows, haven't had a whole lot to tell you. Uh, so if you look at universities, often you'll find that anatomy, chemistry, physiology, biology, and neuroscience are housed in completely separate buildings from you know, physical and occupational therapy, published in different journals, speak very different languages, as I'll show you um, in the next lecture. And so there wasn't a lot of collaboration. And now, well, the fact that I'm speaking to you here today is a great example of how that's changed over the last 25 or 30 years now. A lot of collaborative efforts. Um, people like myself go to the American Physical Therapy Association meeting routinely, for example, and speak to uh, physical therapists about the basic science. And we are starting to learn to understand what the issues are from, from the clinical perspective as well. So it's a really exciting time to be in physical therapy uh, because we're making some incredible advances, both technological and, uh, and in terms of our knowledge of the brain and, and how the brain reacts to, to injury, et, et cetera. <coughs> so, um, we can only, one of the best ways to describe uh, the change in neural rehab over the last few years is to describe it as a paradigm shift, and it certainly is a paradigm shift. Uh, and the first is that we've realized, and I know that you being uh, physical therapy students are, are going to be looking at this thinking, well, yeah, we know this, but trust me when I tell you that it wasn't that long ago when what I'm about to tell you was not considered to be um, uh, well accepted. The first is that CNS injury disease is uh, an acute medical disorder. And that is, so for example, if you look at someone who has a stroke, goes into the hospital, gets admitted to the ER, might spend a few days or a week or two within the ER, um, the amount of time that they spend with a physician after the stroke drops off logarithmically after their, uh, after their stroke. They often don't go back and see the neurologist or see the general, phys the general physician that often. Um, now, that also leads to the next point, which is that neural rehab and physical therapy, for example, is a lifelong disease. And that is, we're now realizing that you don't, it doesn't just end at the clinic. You have to continue the therapies that are being developed uh, in the home and in the community. And there's lots of new programs now, uh, home programs, telerehabilitation, for example, uh, community programs for people who have a brain injury or disease to keep them going after they leave, uh, leave the clinic. And finally, and this is what comes to the uh, major point of, of the two lectures we're going to talk about, is that we now, uh, our understanding of the neurobiology of the brain uh, is leading to the development and can inform the development of novel therapies uh, that can enhance functional outcome. This is what we're going to talk about more in the second lecture than the first. Uh, and this is a really exciting time because when, when I say understanding of neurobiology, I mean our understanding of neuroplasticity and uh, the types of behavioral and neural signals that drive it in the, in the clinical setting. So uh, what drives this paradigm shift? Well, if you've ever used PubMed, this is where we publish our, our articles and they get cited, and you hopped onto PubMed and you did a search for uh, journal articles with the word neuroplasticity in it, you'll see that in the, you know, in the early 1970s there wasn't a whole lot going on, and then somewhere around you know, 1995 or so, there was this huge explosion in the amount of, of, of research that was being done in neuroplasticity. I like to joke with my students because I got my PhD uh, somewhere in around uh, 1996. So there's been a huge amount of research that's been done in neuroplasticity, a huge amount of accuma accumulation of data. And if you do the same test and you look at the number of papers that uh, coin or, or cite the phrase neural rehabilitation, you'll see the same kind of increase in publications. And I would argue uh, that that lag and increase that you see between um, neural rehab citations and neuroplasticity rehabs is the, because the knowledge that we've been developing through these basic science experiments, which were virtually non-existent up until the 1980s, is now driving uh, the, the amount of research, clinical research that's being done in uh, neural rehabilitation. So let's start with uh, part one. And the first part of the, of the lecture today is what is neuroplasticity? So we're going to talk about uh, where the term comes from, and we're also going to talk about uh, so the origins, uh, the definition of neuroplasticity, which, believe it or not, has been something that's been tricky to, to pin down over the years. And also we'll talk just briefly about how we can measure neuroplasticity. Now, to give you an idea of how complex, com complex this is, um, I, I teach an entire semester on the two lectures that you're about to hear. So we're going to sort of hit the high notes on, on each of these different points. So the first question is, well, where does the term neuroplasticity come from? And I know you've all heard it probably in the, in, in the university or, or at conferences or whatnot. Um, so as a graduate student, my, my PhD thesis involved neuroplasticity. And so while I was writing it, I tried to track down 
the origin of a term. So I'd read a paper that would say site plasticity. I'd go find that paper of 1960s, 1930s, 1900s. And finally, the last place I could find it was in a textbook that was written by William James. For those of you who have taken an introductory to psychology course, you know that he was the uh, father of modern day psychology. He wrote this wonderful textbook called um, The Principles of Psychology. And in that textbook, he said, the phenomena of habit in living beings are due to the plasticity of the organic materials of which their bodies are composed. Nervous tissue seems endowed with an extraordinary degree of plasticity. He actually stole the term from metallurgy. So metallurgists have been using this term for years. And what they refer to is if, if a metal or a, a substance a material is plastic, if you bent it enough in one direction or another, eventually that material would take on that shape. So it was plastic. And James recognized the fact that behavior exists within the brain. That was nothing novel. The brain's composed of organic materials. It's, it's a biological organism. Uh, then uh, there must be some adaptation in the biology of the brain, the organic materials, in order for uh, changes in behavior. Now, he calls it habit. You could change the word habit to learning or uh, functional improvement after, uh, after brain injury. And since that time, so since the 1880s, again, we could spend an entire uh, lecture on the history of neuroplasticity. Uh, over the last 140 years, we've had a whole series of, of events and areas that have, that have emerged and, and areas of research that have produced in, in a wealth of information, uh, beginning with you know, the theory of neuroplasticity, and then beginning to show that there were um, examples of biological plasticity within the spinal cord, and then using sensory deprivation techniques, um, then showing that we could potentiate synapses very easily in the 60s and 70s, moving all the way through um, larger examples of plasticity, cortical maps, genetics, um, DNA methylation, and then we get down to the human connectome. But I want to point out here, you'll see that sort of broken up by decade, which is, was arbitrary. Um, I want to point out that everybody's name in here that's in green uh, won a Nobel Prize for their work. So this is work that the medical field, in medicine by the way, uh, this is the work that the medical field takes very seriously and it's led to a lot of medical advances um, over the last 140 years. So keep in mind we know a lot about neuroplasticity. Um, up, when James was studying it, he didn't quite understand uh, what the biology or the organic materials of the brain actually were. However, now we know quite a bit about it. And I'm fortunate enough to have a younger brother who makes video games for a living for electronic arts. And I asked him to make me a, a video to explain to people who may not have a neuroscience degree uh, but wanted to understand how plasticity works in the brain. So this is electronic arts meets neural rehab uh, meets, meets neuroscience. So um, over the last 140 years or so, um, the amount of information that we've gained about how plasticity works in the brain has accumulated uh, at a quick, quick, at a rapid, rapid, rapid rate. And one of the things that we've learned, and we'll talk much more about this in the second lecture, is that plasticity uh, can often begin at the level of the genome. So if you remember back to your cell biology class, you know that the DNA lives with inside the nucleus. And there are, we've identified over the last number of years, for lack of a better term, what we would call plasticity genes. And these are genes that are turned on in response to a variety of types of stimulation, high frequency electrical stimulation, uh, exercise, learning, behavioral training, drugs, uh, those kind of things. And when those genes are transcribed in the nucleus and then they're translated out into the cell body shown here in yellow, then uh, those proteins that are being produced by uh, gene expression go off into the neuron and they impart some biophysical change in the way that that neuron is structured. Uh, lots of different ways this can happen. Um, as a graduate student, the way I was raised is to think about it in terms of the formation of new dendritic spines. And then if you look really closely at these dendritic spines, what you'll find is that there are dendritic arbor, dendritic branches. If you look very closely along these dendritic arbor, these dendritic branches, you'll find that there's an increase in the number of dendritic spines. So why is that important? Well, dendritic spines, as we know, are the sites of synaptic contact. So if you see a neuron or a group of neurons that now have more dendrites and more dendritic spines, that means that they are connecting up with other neurons in a different way. That means that whatever circuit they're involved in has changed in some way, and that's plasticity. So uh, what it tells us that, and this is happening across the 90 billion or so neurons in your brain uh, on a daily basis, it tells us how uh, the brain is encoding information both in a normal circumstance, sort of in the case of an intact brain acquiring information, uh, as well as 
uh, in a, a damaged brain case where the brain is having to reacquire or relearn information. So now, the term neuroplasticity, again, you've probably all heard it, has become so popular within the natural, uh, within, within, our, within our, our public vernacular um, that lots of businesses like Cognifit and Lumosity and Lucas, Lucas Therapy, et cetera, have come up with these ideas that you can train the brain and enhance neuroplasticity. And if you're up late at night watching TV sometimes, you may have seen uh, this commercial. I did it to be quicker. Just to stay sharp. <laughs> to remember people's names. To concentrate a little better. Learn faster. Just not miss stuff. And you know, to get it from in here to out there. No matter why you want a better brain, Lumosity.com can help. It's like a personal trainer for your brain, improving your performance with the science of neuroplasticity, but in a way that just feels like games. Start training with Lumosity.com right now and discover what your brain can do. So they make the claim that it's based on uh, neuroplasticity. And um, I can tell you that it's not. Um, there's no scientific evidence that what they're doing actually promotes plasticity. In fact, they made the claim that they were, uh, their games were good at preventing the onset of Alzheimer's disease, and the FTC actually slapped them with a $16 million, I think, fine back in 2016, um, saying that it was false advertising, so it, they asked them to, to stop um, advertising that they were actually treating the brain, treating brain disease. And if you look carefully at what they're doing, uh, and this is not a bash just on Lumosity, it's a bash on a lot of these games, is what they get really good at doing are the games that they're playing and being trained on. They don't actually, it doesn't actually transfer into activities of daily living, for example. But my point here is that the term neuroplasticity has become uh, part of our, our, our vocabulary, but it used to be just a term reserved for neuroscientists and was always locked away in journals and obscure places in the library. But now it's become part of, part of our, uh, our public vocabulary. So what's a good definition of plasticity? And this is important as we move forward, we need to agree on a good definition. And a generic definition that's not biased by an experimental manipulation or an experimental approach is the following. You can define neuroplasticity as any change in neuron structure or function uh, that can be observed across uh, individual or populations of neurons. So if you think about that for a second, structure, function, individual, population neurons, that means that there are four categories of plasticity. So you can have structural plasticity in individual neurons. So we can go in using a microscopy and measure dendrites and look at synapse size, synapse number, those kind of things. We can also, um, typically in a clinical setting, we can go in and use things like magnetic resonance imaging, look at cortical thickness, um, the, the cortical volume or the size of a brain structure, the pattern of connectivity between brain areas, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, at, the popula or at the functional level, you can have changes in uh, the function of individual neurons. Um, how easy are they to get to fire? How fast do they fire? How often do they fire? When do they fire? Um, but we can also measure uh, function across populations of neurons using things like uh, magnetic resonance imaging, um, PET or MEG, EEG, those kind of things that measure uh, the activity either through blood glucose, oxygen, and deoxygenation levels or just electrical activity of, of populations of, of, of neurons. And so there's basically four general ways that we can go in and measure and measure plasticity. And the other important point here is that um, plasticity is a fundamental property of nervous tissue. And what I mean by that is that, and it's evolutionarily conserved, so if you look at anything from a fruit fly to a sea slug to a bird to a rat to a monkey to a cat to a human, uh, they all show all, the, all their nervous systems as simple or as complex as they may be are all capable of exhibiting plasticity. And they all show very similar kinds of plasticity, that is increases in synapses, increases in dendrites. And the neural cell signaling systems that control plasticity in the fruit fly are very similar to the neural cell signaling systems that are controlled in the human brain. And that's really good for us as researchers because we can study these uh, reduced models and try to apply them in the human setting. And it also means that if it's such a fundamental property of the nervous system, that means that after the brain's been injured, it's not gonna change the rules. So the same fundamental cell signaling and behavioral uh, signals that drive plasticity are gonna be the same whether the brain has been, has been injured uh, or not. So let's review uh, a couple of questions from, uh, from part one. So the first question is, uh, where does the term neuroplasticity come from? The second term is, uh, can you defi our second question is, can you define neuroplasticity? And the third question is, to see if you're paying attention, is uh, what are the four categories of neuroplasticity? 
What are the four different ways that we can measure neuroplasticity? Okay, so we're going to head on to the second part. So we've talked about defining neuroplasticity, how it's measured, etc. Now we're going, to, we're going to talk about why is neuroplasticity important for rehabilitation. And we're going to get more in, more in depth into this when we get into the, the second lecture. Um, but what we're going to cover roughly today in this part of the lecture is um, one of the important points is why does damage or disease to the central nervous system create what I would call a new nervous system? Uh, not just a, a brain minus a piece of tissue, it's a brand new nervous system. And the second is, uh, well, how does plasticity play a role in functional movement or functional improvement? How does that actually work? So one of the questions I'm hoping you're asking yourself, and hopefully you asked before you started to watch this lecture is, as a therapist, you should be asking yourself, well, and when I first started doing this, I was explaining to my good friend who was a physical therapist over dinner one night, who was a physical therapist in Canada, and he, he said, you know, it's all really cool, uh, but what, what does that buy me on Monday when I go in the clinic and I'm working with um, the kids that I'm working with or working with the adults that I'm working with? And it's a, it's a really good question. And so to try and answer that question for you, um, I want you to do the following thought experiment. So imagine that you walk into uh, a, 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 an orchestra pit or a symphony hall, rather, and the, the orchestra is playing a piece of music that you, re, you remember or recognize. Maybe it's Beethoven or it's Mozart. And uh, you listen to it, and then the conductor says, hey, come on up. Why don't, you, why don't you give it a shot? So I don't know how many of you are actual music conductors. Um, I'm, I'm guessing not very, very many. But imagine that you walked up there, and you got up on, onto stage. And as you walked up there and got on stage, uh, the violin section walked out. And now the, your job is to get that orchestra to play that same piece of music in the same way it was played before uh, without your violin section. And so the question is, well, how would you do it? Well, if you're like me who likes music and enjoys and can recognize when it's played well versus not, but can't read or write or play anything, um, I would probably say, you know, all right, guys, just you know, keep practicing, keep practicing. We're going to get it, and you know, see how they do. Uh, which is how therapy was for years. Just keep practicing, keep practicing. Uh, you're going to get better. Um, now, imagine that we pose the same problem to somebody like Mozart or Beethoven, and I can guarantee you what they would probably do is crawl down into the orchestra pit and probably rearrange the way that people were sitting and playing. Maybe have some of the, some of the people playing. Uh, cello start to play violin um, and start to rewrite the music a little bit and I can guarantee you that Beethoven's orchestra is going to sound markedly better uh, than my orchestra and that's because he understands how music is produced and the nuances of how music is produced. So I'm hoping that you see and can draw the analogy here between uh, music and behavior and the orchestra and the brain and by understanding how to adapt the orchestra in order to produce a sound that is more normal uh, by understanding the biology of the brain and how to adapt the brain, we might come up with uh, more effective ways to make uh, behavior more normal in folks with a brain injury or, or brain disease. So one of the ways that we can do this to study the brain is to look at how the brain is connected. And the way that the brain functions depends entirely, well largely, on how it's interconnected. And a very cool technique that's come out in the last few years is something called diffusion uh, tension imaging, uh, tensor imaging. And you've all heard of the Human Genome Project. There's something called the Human Connectome Project that the NIH funded, where they took 1,200 brains and using this high-definition high tractography, they mapped out all of the connections uh, within the brain uh, at, at a, fairly, a fairly detailed level. And the way it works is you go in and you take a standard MRI, and which, which some of you may have had or been involved in, and then using a mathematical algorithm, you can figure out which fibers are heading in the same direction. And it turns out that luckily enough, the way the brain is organized is fibers either head this way or that way, and they weave in together, almost like weaving a fabric together, and the final group of fibers head this way. And it's true no matter which, where you are in the brain, that same three-layered and three-pronged um, um, formation. And it figures out which way fibers are heading. So you can sit in your brain, and you can take what's called a seed, and you can place this seed in the brain, and it shows you where in the brain all the fibers that are coming in and out of the brain. And fibers that are heading in certain directions get certain colors. 
So for example, this is looking at all of the fibers in the brain. So the, the blue fibers are heading in one direction, the, the orange fibers are heading in another. Um, this here is actually a uh, DTI of my brain. So if I stand up sort of close enough to it, that's my cortical spinal tract that you can see that's coming down uh, to, my, to my spinal cord. Um, so what's cool about that is you can take all of those connections and you can create what's called a connectogram or sometimes called a connectograph. And so all it is is a wheel where each of these areas on the outside represent a different brain area. So it could be occipital lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, it could be the basal ganglia and so forth. And each of these little dots represents a node within those areas, an identified node. And it shows, what the wheel shows you, the connectogram shows you, is how heavily interconnected the brain is. And what's interesting is that when you do this, either through tractography in the human brain or through tractography in track tracing in animals, what you find is that most brain areas are about three stops or three connections away from each other. In other words, if you took a dart, threw it at the brain, took another dart, threw it at the brain, you could probably find three stops, three subway stops, if you will, to get to that second brain area. Um, and if you're having trouble wrapping your head around this, this is, my, this is one of the ways I like to think about it. This is the uh, Oracle of Kevin Bacon. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. This was, uh, I believe it was an MIT project, an honors thesis, where what the students did was they typed in every actor's name and the movie that, that they were in, and then they could, uh, using movie genealogy, link them all to Kevin Bacon. And so if so-and-so was in a movie with so-and-so, who was in a movie with so-and-so, with Kevin Bacon. So you can actually link people together. And, if, and I played around with this. The furthest I could get was five uh, by typing in random, random actors' names, obscure actor, actors' names. But if you, even if you just look at what, what this diagram shows you, it's almost the same as the brain. Roughly three connections is, uh, on average, uh, how far you are, from any, away you are from any two points in the brain. The reason I'm telling you this is because having the brain be so heavily interconnected is sort of a double-edged sword. And one of the problems is that if you damage even a small part of the brain, it's going to affect a large number of brain areas because it's so heavily interconnected. The other advantage to it, however, is that because it's so heavily interconnected, it's laid out in a way that allows for uh, functional recovery. And we'll talk more about that uh, in the next lecture. So to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, this is an example of four different patients that have had strokes in four different areas. Uh, so in this case, you've got a patient, as shown here in blue, you've got a patient here in the posterior part of the brain. Uh, it's not that large, but that's what, the connect, that's what the connectogram looks like. This patient over on this side has a lesion in the same area, much smaller, and so that's what their connectogram looks like. So you can see that even though the, the lesion's in the same spots, the connectograms look different, partially because of, of the size. And if you look at the comparison of connectograms in patients who have had damage to, for example, cerebellum, versus uh, a midline cortex uh, stroke, you could see that their connectomes are very different. So you could just tell by just glancing at this that damage to one area of the brain causes dramatic changes that occur across the brain and are not just limited to that one place where the damage occurred. And that's important because the way to think about brain injury is not the brain minus a piece of tissue. It is a brain that has now adapted to the fact that that piece of tissue is missing. So in other words, you have literally a brand new brain or a brand new CNS. And so the impairments that you see in patients and the capacity for recovery that you see in patients is due in part to the location and, and severity of the damage. And it's also due to the capacity of the rest of the brain to maintain function uh, after the injury. So can that residual tissue actually maintain function? Now this is an example of stroke. We can also talk about it in the case of a much slower moving disease such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, so this is the brain of a healthy person and this is the brain of someone who has Alzheimer's disease and as you probably know, um, it's a slow moving neurodegenerative disorder that occurs over years and symptoms slowly and gradually appear. We'll talk more about that in the next lecture. And you can see the dramatic difference in the amount of brain connectivity between these two connectograms. So keeping in mind that brain connectivity is what allows the brain to function normally and when you start messing with that and reducing it and changing it, that's when you start to see uh, functional impairments and functional, functional deficits. So uh, what's the goal of rehabilitation then? Uh, well, one way to think about it is the following, and one, one approach is, is the following. Let's imagine that you have a brain, and uh, this particular brain area has function A, and when that function is being acquired and it's being learned, let's imagine it's a motor function, learning to play the piano, uh, plasticity occurs within that brain area. Uh, then years later, um, you have a stroke 
And this is what a stroke looks like on an MRI. You see this large white area um, here on the, on the right side. Then you have a stroke in that area. So whatever function that brain area had is, is now gone. Um, so one of the ideas behind this is, and, and the governing hypothesis that most of us who study these kinds of things believe, is that recovery is really a relearning re experience where whatever the residual tissue is that's left over is uh, engaged in relearning whatever the function of this brain area was that was lost because of the stroke. So as it says here at the top of the slide, what you're trying to do is re-engage the nervous system into a, a relearning state and try and get those brain areas um, to learn. So here's a, a, a mid-question for you. Why is relearning in the compromised brain fundamentally different than learning in the intact brain? So it's not just that simple. It would be great if it was just simply taking function A that was gone and putting it over into a second brain area. One of the problems is that the rest of the brain has been doing function B or function C for 65 or 70 years. Now you're asking it to do something completely different. And it may be something that wasn't designed or developed to do. And so that's difficult, uh, difficult to do. Uh, the other is those brain areas might be compromised for the same reasons that we just talked about. So the brain is so heavily interconnected that when you pull that one brain out, um, those other brain areas become dysfunctional. So now you're asking a brain area that may not be as good at doing what the lost brain area was, and in addition to that, it's handicapped in some kind of a way because of the fact it's lost its synaptic partners. We'll get more into that. We talk about neural strategies in um, the second lecture. Okay, so um, let's look at some review questions. Um, the first question is, uh, what is a connectogram? Uh, why does uh, damage or disease to the, the central nervous system create a new CNS? And how does plasticity play a role in functional improvement? Okay, so uh, the third part of the lecture is we're going to head into uh, talking about the behavioral and neural signals that drive plasticity. And if you remember anything from any of these two lectures uh, that I'm going to give you today, I'm hoping it's this slide right here. And the way that we think about how plasticity is induced in the brain is you engage in some behavioral or learning or rehabilitation task. That then engages or drives changes in neural activity, changes in neurochemical release, changes in neurophysiology, that then orchestrates plasticity, those signals orchestrate plasticity, which mediate functional improvement or, or learning in the normal brain. So what does that mean for neural rehab? Well, if we can really understand what these behavioral signals are and what these neural signals are, we can step in and try and make sure that we're driving the proper behavioral signals and we're driving um, or adding in therapies that enhance those neural signals, whether it be drugs or brain stimulation, and we'll talk more about that uh, in, the, in the second lecture. So keep this, this uh, schematic and this flowchart in mind as we work our way through the next, um, the next uh, lecture or two. So, uh, okay, so part three is we're going to talk about the behavioral signals that drive plasticity. And the main topics here will be, uh, well, what is use-dependent plasticity? And what are the key elements of use? So what exactly is use or practice? And finally, why is understanding this uh, important for neural rehabilitation? So uh, we talked about uh, use it or lose it, right? So, and you've all heard this term before. And this is a term that neuroscientists have been using for years. And the idea is that uh, a brain area that is not being used uh, will somehow degenerate or be lost or be used uh, for something else. And so um, and we've applied it to voting, we've applied it to working out, we've applied it to hair loss, we've applied it to uh, health insurance. Uh, etc. So this is my favorite example of use-dependent plasticity. So this is Denis. Denis had his hands blown off in a mining accident. This is what he looked like six years after the accident. Here he is after a double hand transplant. So he's sitting in his office and I'd like you to watch carefully um, what he's doing. So you can see that he's dialing the phone. He's using a pen to write with. Um, he can pick up and um, shuffle papers. Um, he can, so if you didn't know any better, his mobility looks a little off. If you look carefully, as a physical therapist, you're, you're, you have a keen eye. You'll probably notice that his mobility is not exactly right. So, for example, to get the pencil in the, in, in the hand that he wants to use, he has to use um, his other hand to, to get the, the pen into his hand. You watch him, so you'll see him do it there. But other than that, it's hard to believe that those aren't his hands, that they were actually attached. Um, they were donated by someone, uh, like an organ donor. So what happens to his brain? Well, we've known for years that the motor cortex is organized in the following way. Your hand area sits uh, right up here in the, on the precentral gyrus, 
and just sort of midway down, I'll show you a TMS video here in a second, uh, the face area is a little bit more lateral and the forearm area is a little bit more medial. So if you sort of mapped out the body onto the, onto the, the, bo the cortex, it would look something like that. And we also know that if you uh, remove the hands, then suddenly the hand area has got nothing to do. The hands aren't there. So it's got n nothing to, to control. And one of the things that happens is the face area moves into uh, the hand area within, within the cortex. And often you'll have patients who've had a limb amputation where if you touch their face, they'll claim that you're actually touching a hand or an arm that's not there. Uh, it's phantom limb sensation. So we've known this for a long time, but this is a rare opportunity where we could take somebody's brain who we're pretty sure looked like this before the operation, and they did. They looked at his brain before the operation. Then they put the hands back on. So you put the hands back on to the patient, and you then look at this to see what happens in the brain. And after about a month, you start to see this smattering of hand representation reappearing in the area that the face invaded. And if you look three months later, you see a little bit more. And if you look six months later, you see even more. Now, it never quite comes back to being exactly the same, but you can see that the hand area returns. So take the hands off, the hand area goes away. Put the hands back on, the hand area uh, comes back. So one of the questions then is, uh, why do you think the face area invades the hand area instead of the forearm area invading the hand area? Keep in mind that prior to the amputation, they're both neighbors of the hand area, and yet the face area is the area that invades. Well, the answer is probably because if you removed your hands, uh, the odds of you using your arms as much as you did before are, are probably lower. And you use your face and you know, your, your lips and your mouth and your tongue uh, a lot more than you um, would use the hands that are missing. So there's an activity-dependent competition that occurs within the brain. Because you're using your face so much, it wins out the competition and it invades and takes over um, takes over that space, and that's likely the, likely the explanation. But when we say use, as in uh, use-dependent plasticity, and if you go back to the example that I gave you about an orchestra where I, where I said, practice guys, practice guys, just keep doing what you're doing, you're going to get better. Uh, what do we mean by use? So is it just practice, or can we take that word use and try and identify key elements of use that drive plasticity? And the answer is yes. And so a colleague of mine, Teresa Jones, and I uh, wrote a paper a few years ago looking at, well, going through the literature and saying, well, what are the key elements? And what we found was that repetition is important. You need a sufficient amount of repetition. Uh, whatever behavior it is that you're engaged in, whether it's an animal or a person, has to be salient, that it, it has to be uh, important for the, the organism. Uh, specificity, and by specificity I mean here that the only those neural circuits that are engaged in the task are the ones that are going to be adapted. Difficulty is also important. Uh, so there has to be a, a, a substantial level of challenge. So a sweet spot of challenge, as I'll show you in a few slides. So if it's a very simple task, plasticity really doesn't occur. If it's a very difficult task, plasticity uh, also doesn't occur. But if it's a, uh, the moderate level of difficulty, that's the best way to drive plasticity. Uh, timing, and by here I mean uh, in, in the motor world, the timing of movements. So that movements that are made together stay together and are encoded together within the brain. Uh, intensity, so not just repetition, so not just one repetition a day, but having enough repetition over a short enough period of time that you can get, get plasticity. So let me just give you a, a couple of examples of how important this is. And repetition, you're a physical therapist, you know that repetition is important. Um, this is an interesting uh, summary of how, much, how many repetitions it takes to become an expert in these, in these various fields. So for example, if you want to become an expert cigar maker, um, you need to roll about 3 million cigars. If you want to be a professional baseball pitcher, you've got to throw about 1.6 million pitches. Now keep that in mind uh, when you're in the clinic, when you start thinking about how many active repetitions a patient is actually making uh, when you're giving them therapy. And we're going to come back to that uh, in, the next, in the next lecture. So one of the ways, if you're looking at plasticity, one of the uh, easy brain areas to look at is um, the, our, our motor maps. And this is, I'm biased, this is why it's in the lecture, this is my area of, of interest in neuroscience. And I'm sure you've all taken neuroanatomy now, you know, about neural map, you know about motor maps and how there's a homunculus where adjacent body parts are represented on adjacent areas of the, of the cortex. And in fact, the more dexterous you are at moving a body part, the larger the area of cortex that's devoted to it. In fact, if your body matched what your cortex looked like, 
you would look something like this, and they call it the homunculus. You'd have giant hands and giant face and you know, very small feet um, based on the amount of cortex that's devoted to that, to that body. So I want to show you a video uh, that will show you um, how TMS works in uh, my TMS lab. So what I'm going to show you is a demonstration of transcranial magnetic stimulation. And the basic setup is you have a chair that the subject will sit in, and you've got a TMS coil. And the coils come in a variety of different shapes, but the premise is basically the same. So there is a figure eight coil of uh, copper wires that are tightly wound in here. And we've got a machine that's going to send an electrical current through at a pulse width of about uh, between 100 to 200 microseconds. And that quick change in electrical field will create, uh, through electromagnetic induction, a uh, magnetic field that will carry that electrical charge um, into the brain. So we have our subject here. This is our TMS simulation apparatus. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to simulate um, Dave's left motor cortex and uh, try and evoke a movement in his right hand. Now, typically, we hook up um, EMG electrodes and record very small changes in muscle contraction, but what we're going to do today is turn up the current a little bit and actually try and evoke a movement. So the trick is to finding out where the, the motor strip is. Um, and so uh, the motor strip lies roughly, the precentral gyrus lies roughly uh, about where, where the, the top of a pair of headphones would run across the, across the top of the brain. So we're going to arm the system and we're going to start off at a relatively low current level. So I'll start off around 40. Are you ready? Okay. So I'm going to place this roughly about where motor cortex is. I'll stimulate. And the current levels are too low, so I'm going to turn it up. Stimulate again. Try and find some motor cortex. Uh, there. So you'll notice that his right hand is twitching. And we're going to go down a little bit just to try and isolate the hand. There. So what you can see is on his right hand, we're getting some twitches of his fingers. And that is uh, representing the um, electromagnetic induction of the neurons within the primary motor cortex. So the current is passing through his hair, through his skull, through his, scal his scalp, his skull, uh, through spinal fluid, meninges, into the top layer of his motor cortex, which is then activating his cortical spinal neurons that are heading down to his spinal cord, uh, synapsing with the ventral horn motor neurons, and then projecting on out to uh, the muscle. Now the advantage to this is you can, you can map out uh, the motor cortex. The disadvantage is that uh, the current dissipates quickly as it leaves the, the paddle. And so uh, you can only really stimulate, with, with this particular configuration, you can only really stimulate uh, neurons that are at the surface of the cortex. So you can't stimulate, for example, the thalamus without using a, 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 a very different approach. So um, there are various different types of coils. So the one that um, we just used to stimulate subjects uh, is a, it's called a figure eight coil, and as I explained before, it's got the tightly wound coils, uh, and the center of the electromagnetic field is sort of focused in the center. Now you can use a single, single coil, but it's not as focused or as intense, so what people have done, they've designed them so that they've got double coils to increase the overlapping field within the, uh, electric, uh, within the magnetic field to create a more focal, focal simulation area. Um, now, one of the problems that uh, you have, you wanted to stimulate if we're stimulating the hand area, if you wanted to stimulate the leg area, the problem is if you remember back to your neuroanatomy class, you know that in the brain, um, the hand area, the mouth area, and face area are located laterally on the cortex. However, the leg areas, so your feet and your hips and your knees, are located uh, inside the longitudinal uh, fissure. So it's located inside the middle of the brain. So the problem is that when you're stimulating with that figure eight coil, the one I just showed you, you're stimulating like this. And so you can hit these areas and bring their lateral, but if you want to get down inside here and stimulate the leg area, it's a lot trickier. Uh, and so they've designed a special coil for that, 
is the uh, conical coil, which is this guy right here. And this conical coil sits over top of the brain like this, and the um, magnetic pulse is then focused down inward. So we go back to our, our brain again. And uh, what you're doing now is you're focusing that stimulation down into the middle of the longitudinal sulcus, which allows you to get at that leg area and evoke movement or evoke muscle contractions within, within the leg area. Now, the final type of TMS that we're gonna talk about, so what we've, we've talked about so far is what's called single pulse TMS. You can remember, we were stimulating, there's one pulse and we see one movement of the hand. You can also do what's called repetitive TMS, and that's when you use a system like this. And so rather than delivering one pulse per second, you're delivering you know, anywhere from two to 20 uh, pulses per second. High frequency stimulation using a, a, a simulator like this, um, around 20 hertz will increase brain excitability. Uh, low frequency stimulation, around four or five hertz, will actually decrease brain excitability. So you can use this as a tool to increase or decrease brain area excitability transiently. You'll also notice that what's different about this is that it has a fan on it. And the reason this has a fan on it is because with single pulse, every time you send a, a, a pulse through the coil, it heats up a little bit. It heats up a little bit. So slowly over time, the coil can actually overheat. So if you're gonna be giving 20 pulses a second, you know, for three, four, five minutes, you need to have a fan on the coil to keep it cool so that the, the, the coil won't shut down. Okay, so as was mentioned in the video, the TMS drives the corticospinal neurons, which then project down to the ventral horn, which then project on out to uh, the muscle and cause small muscle contractions. And we measure those as what are called motor evoke potentials, which are small changes in the potential as the muscle as the muscle contracts. And so it's a very useful tool for doing a variety of things. And to give an example of how easy it is to induce plasticity within the motor cortex and how important repetition is, um, we ran an experiment where we looked at the first dorsal interosseous muscle, and we trained subjects on a task which we called the lose your marbles task, which was basically a, a task where uh, we placed a marble in the center of a board with like a touchstone phone uh, with nine numbers, and they had to move the marble back and forth from each target, um, 400 different targets in each session. And we measured the number of errors they made, we measured how quickly they could do it, and uh, what we found was that over the course of about two weeks, this is how fast they did it, uh, that's, this is the number of, of errors that they made, and as you can see, that over time, they get much faster at it, and they make much, much fewer errors. And we map them, we map their, their FDI area using TMS in, in the video that I just showed you, and we map them on each of these days uh, that are shown here on the x-axis, uh, before and after training. And we did that for two reasons. One is we can find out, well, what's the immediate response to the cortex to training? So right before and right after training. And we could also compare across days. So compare map one from days one, three, five, eight, and so forth. So rather than showing you a whole bunch of data, I'm just going to show you the schematic. So here's what happened. You bring the subjects in on day one. You map them before training and after training. You'll see that the maps get bigger. Uh, then they go back home, and they're also practicing on between day one and day three. And we map them again, but the maps are small again, and they get bigger again, just like they did it on day one. Day five, you bring them back. They're smaller again, and they get larger again. Now here's the interesting part. Somewhere between day five and day eight, Subjects would come in and the maps that were big at the end of day five are now big at the end of, of day eight. And that continued on uh, for the full two weeks, two weeks of training. So the maps would start out small, you train them, they get big, they go home, they get small. They get big, they get small, they get big, they get small. And eventually, somewhere around between day five and eight, the maps would stay large. And if you look at the relationship between when that happened and the number of repetitions, you find that somewhere in around uh, 2,000 repetitions is when those maps stay large in between training sessions. So again, keep that in mind when you're in the clinic, uh, how many repetitions are your patients getting every time you see them? Uh, in, our, in our hands and in other hands, um, somewhere around 2,000 repetitions over the course of a week seems to be um, the, a key number. Uh, so intensity, another important, important behavioral signal, and there's been a few studies looking at the effects of intensity on brain morphology. So one of them looked at the number of hours per day of musicians that they trained and correlated that with the amount of the percentage of the brain that was occupied by the cerebellum. And what you can see is there's a nice correlation between the size of the cerebellum and the number of hours that they practice. So more hours, larger cerebellum. Timing is also important. So um, this is actually one of my favorite studies where they looked at volleyball players and runners. And what they found was that if they, if they looked at the medial deltoid and the ECR muscles, which are located, uh, again, along the motor strip within the motor cortex, they mapped it out, 
And they found that if you think about what volleyball players do is they time their wrist extension and flexions with their shoulder movements as opposed to runners where the arms really aren't, not that they're not important for the skill of running, you know, biomechanics are important, but they're not nowhere near the coordinated movements that a volleyball player is making. And what they found was that if you compare runners to volleyball players, uh, the maps were larger in the volleyball players, first of all, because skill drives, uh, drives map changes, and there was more overlap between them. So movements that are linked together in time uh, seem to be also linked together within the brain. Um, so, if you really want to study some of these phenomena, the behavioral signals and neural signals, uh, one of the most common research animals are laboratory rats. This is one of the animals that, in addition to people that I, that I work with. Laboratory rats are incredibly clever animals, and we use them as a model of upper extremity function. And as my, my um, good friend Tim Schauer used to say, rats are front wheel drive. And here's the evidence. If you go into a rat colony, and you pick up a rat by its butt, and you hold them out over a table, you'll see that it explores the table with its four paws. And if you take that same rat and you hold him up by his armpits, not so much. Uh, so the point is that rats are really clever at using their upper extremities. You can train them to do all kinds of things. So for example, you can train them to reach out and grab a lever and pull that lever to get food. They can learn that fairly quickly. You can train them to reach through a plexiglass slot and grab banana flavored food pellets. Rats really love banana flavored food pellets. You can hear them chewing in the background. And if you give them sunflower seeds, rats also love sunflower seeds. They can open up a sunflower seed about this size in about five seconds, which may not seem um, all that impressive to you, but think about the relative size of that, of that sunflower seed. Uh, and they also love uh, vermicelli. So you can hear this guy chewing on his vermicelli. And they'll grab it and they'll telescope it in and make these very fine finger or digit adjustments as they telescope that piece of vermicelli in. They all do it in very similar ways. So we can look at these behaviors uh, before and after brain injury, for example, and find out and use it as a measure of, of, of recovery. Uh, so here's the problem, though. When you're working with humans, you've got this big brain to work with. Um, but when you're working with rats, you've got uh, an area about the size of your thumb. So how would you map out the cortex of a brain that's about you know, that size? Um, so one of the techniques we use is something called intracortical microstimulation. So it's like TMS, except at a much smaller scale. And except, for, except we don't use a magnetic current, we use an actual electrical current. So you expose the cortex, and you take a really small glass microelectrode, and you systematically move it across the cortex, and you drop it down into uh, layer five, where the cortical spinal neurons live. And then you pass really small amounts of current. So in our rats, it's about 60 microamps, if that makes uh, any sense to you. And you watch to see the animals are anesthetized. You watch to see what the animals are doing when you stimulate. So you can see in this guy, we see a little bit of wrist, possibly a little bit of elbow in there as well. And then you keep track of what those movements are, and you color code them. So for example, wrist representations are, are in green, and digit representations are in green, elbow and shoulder are in blue. And if you make a map of this, so we can take this tiny, tiny little rat, uh, area of the rat brain, and we can map out their shoulder and their, their uh, wrist and digit, the proximal versus distal movements, and you can get a map. So these are, these are the areas that are controlled by the wrist and digit, and the blue areas are elbow and shoulder. And one of the things we've done is to try and find out, well, how do those maps and how does synapse number respond to different types of therapies? And so this is one of my favorite experiments we did a long time ago, where we took animals that were skill trained, so they had to learn to reach out, grab that food pellet, and bring it back in. It's not something rats are normally accustomed to doing in their home cage. We had another group that were allowed to reach for food, but never actually acquired it. Um, so that was to increase their activity, increase the use, but it wasn't a skilled use. It was just a constant reaching. Then we dropped the pellet in there every once in a while to keep them, keep them interested. Um, then we had a, Mike Rempel, a student in my lab, came up with an idea. He was a strength trainer. Uh, he weighed 180, bench 370, big strong guy. And he came up with a way of strength training rats. And so the way he did it was he took rats and he gave them one strand of spaghetti and they'd reach out and break it off no problem. And he kept adding more and more strands of spaghetti until eventually they couldn't break the spaghetti and he'd back it off one and he would call it their one rep max. So then he put them on the same strength training regime he was on, which was 10 reps of 10 um, every other day for a month at 60% of their one rep max and he would up it with angel hairs like the big plates and the small plates at the gym. And anyway, long story short, they went from breaking four or five pieces of pasta to breaking um, 12 or 13. Uh, and the final groups, so we got strength trainers, control group, and we've got our skilled guys. And the final group were our endurance guys. Uh, and these were rats that were housed with a running wheel. Uh, 
And you can see, if you look carefully in, in this picture, uh, you can see that the, the rat's nose is poking out there through the hole, and they would run the running wheels. Um, and uh, they would run some on the order of four kilometers, so you know, two, two, two and a bit miles uh, a night. And so now we can compare all these three different, so same research animals, just four different very motor experiences. And what we found is that the training experience dictated the type of plasticity and the pattern of plasticity that we saw. So rather than showing you a bunch of graphs, just let me show you what happened. So if you look at the cortex, what we found is that skill training did two things. One is it induced motor map reorganization. So they had increases in wrist and the guys that were skill trained had increases in wrist and digit movement representations. They also had more synapses in uh, layer five of the motor cortex. If you were an endurance trained rat, so the running wheel rats, they didn't see map changes, we didn't see synapse changes, but we saw an increase in angiogenesis. So more blood vessels were found within the cortex and that's a good thing. We also looked at our strength trained guys and we found that um, guys who were strength trained didn't show any of the cortical changes that we, we noted in the uh, endurance and skill trained guys, but we did find there was an increase in the number of synapses in the spinal cord, and that's probably due to an increase in the recruitment of motor neurons uh, to drive, motor units rather, to drive increases in strength. Lots of evidence out there that a large portion of increases in strength are due to changes in the CNS, not just, not just simply growth in, in muscle fibers. So the next behavioral signal we want to talk about is uh, difficulty. And uh, one of the, the uh, experimental methodologies people have used to, to, to drive learning in rats is the following. So you take a rat, you place him into a cage with a, a mesh, metal mesh floor that's hooked up to a very mild battery. So you can pass a mild weak shock through the cage. But you also place in a speaker that plays a tone and a lever that they can press. And what they do is they present them with uh, tones at different frequencies. And uh, after a certain frequency, every time the rat receives a mild shock. And so the rats very quickly learn that when they hear that one frequency, if they press that lever, they can avoid the shock. And rats can learn this very quickly over a couple of days. Then instead of a motor map, because now you're training their auditory system to recognize sounds, you can go in and you can map out their auditory cortex. So this is the uh, auditory map of a rat. So ranging from uh, high frequencies to low frequencies, what they're called uh, isofrequency zones. And you can map them out just like you map movement. In this case, however, you're just listening to the neurons and you, when you play a tone as opposed to stimulating the brain areas. And if you look at the maps of rats that were trained, so if you imagine that we've taken a rat and we've trained them on the task, and the, this is in the gray area here, that's the frequency at which we train them uh, to recognize the, or the, the experimenters trained them to recognize the tone. And if you look at those, that same animal after a few days of training, what you find is that that area of the auditory cortex that responds to uh, the trained area uh, has increased. So before it was fairly small, now uh, it's fairly large. So it's a, a fairly, a fairly well-established learning paradigm. Now you can start to play these games with them. And so Mike Kilgard's lab has done some experiments where he can make it really easy. So if the rat hears a tone at any frequency, it presses the bar, they avoid the, they avoid the shock. They can learn that in minutes. Then he starts making it a little harder. So a range of frequencies, one specific frequency, all the way up to the point where the rats had to do sort of simple math, where it was half of whatever the frequency was before. Rats can't do it. So he had very, six different groups from very easy to very hard. And what he found was that if you look at the amount of performance change, this isn't surprising. If something is very easy, there's not much of a change in performance. You learn it very quickly. If something is very hard, there's also very little. If it's too hard for you to perform, it's, there's very little change in performance. But if it's somewhere in the sweet spot, where it's not so hard that you can't do it, but not so easy that you get it the first time, there is a change in performance. You get better at it. So gaming, the gaming world has known this for years. I think there's 500 and some levels on Halo. They keep making it incrementally harder for you to, to make it to the next level. And if you compare uh, their performance change with the amount of plasticity that occurred, so how much of the auditory maps were reorganized, what was, what was the, the magnitude of the reorganization, they look very simple. So in fact, there's a sweet spot. If you want a great change in performance, you need to balance easiness with difficultness. And if you want a great change in plasticity, it matches up very nicely. So the greater the change in behavior that you see, the greater the change in uh, cortical plasticity. And you can use that same model to study salience. And so what I've learned, um, having been spending time with physical and occupational therapists the last 20 years or so, is that of these signals that we're talking about, um, salience is probably the most important one. 
uh, subjects, patients rather, will not engage in a task unless they're interested in it. So only behavioral relevant um, experiences will drive plasticity. Uh, and we'll talk more about it in the next lecture. So I showed you this data already. So frequency, here's a control animal. Here's the trained frequency. You can see that after learning, there's an increase in the frequency. Well, it turns out in the brain, there's also a loudness map. So one of the ways you can tell how loud things are is it activates certain areas of the auditory cortex. So you've got a frequency map and a loudness map. So if you look at the loudness map of animals that learn frequency, there's no change. Now, if you take animals and train them to recognize loudness, you see the opposite. You see no change in their frequency maps. Or if they're trained to, to learn frequency, there's no change in the loudness maps. If they're trained to learn loudness, you do see a, a change in their loudness maps. So think about it this way. You've got two rats. Both are sitting in cages, similar cages. They're hearing exactly the same kinds of noises, some loud, some soft, some high frequency, some low frequency. One group has to pay attention to frequency, and that's it. Their frequency maps change. One group doesn't care about frequency. They have to learn loudness. Their loudness maps change. And that uh, re is reflected neurophysiologically in the types of, of um, reorganization that you see within the brains. So it's, when it's salient to them, and obviously for rats, it's, it's salient to them. OK, so uh, for part three, we've got three review questions. The first is, uh, what are the key behavioral signals that drive neuroplasticity? The second is, uh, what is TMS, and what is it used for? And the third is, what is the experimental evidence that task difficulty is important for uh, driving plasticity? OK, so we've talked about the behavioral signals. The final thing we're going to talk about in the lecture today is uh, our neural signals. So you've got the behavioral signals, the six that I told you about. Now you've, we're going to talk just very briefly. We could spend a whole semester again on this. I'm just going to show you for a few minutes uh, what are some of the interesting things that are, that are on the horizon. So this brings us to uh, the fourth part of our lecture, which is what are the neural signals that are driving plasticity? Uh, we're going to talk very briefly about the basic elements of neural signaling and what sorts of, uh, how these elements can be modified in order to, to drive plasticity. So the basic elements, if you think about the most simple neural circuit there is of just two neurons. So we've got neuron A, uh, shown here in blue, and then you've got neuron B, shown here in gray. Um, you've got the way the synaptic transmission works, you've all taken uh, neuroanatomy, is the three elements are how active is this neuron? So neural activity. The second is, what are the extracellular signals that are being released? What are the neurotransmitters that are being released? And the third is, well, what happens to this neuron once those neurotransmitters activate that cell? What happens to, uh, to the cell? We're going to talk just briefly about these, about these two um, today. So uh, one of the big discoveries in neuroplasticity was uh, back in the early 1970s by a couple of guys by the name of Bliss and Lomo. And they took a rabbit brain, so this is a cross-section of a rabbit brain. So if I was a rabbit, you would be cutting my, my brain this way, and you're looking at it from here. Uh, and the rabbit, has a, a rabbit brain has an area called the perforant path, which is part of the hippocampus. So this is the hippocampus, the sort of jelly roll um, structure here. This is the perforant path that projects into um, the hippocampus. It's a very nice place for physiologists to study because it's a well-established trisynaptic circuit. It's a, very great, it's a great place to study. It's not a jungle like the, like the cortex. And so what they did was they put a stimulating electrode into that perforant path, and they put a recording electrode into the hippocampus. And so they would stimulate at high frequency, what they call a tetanus. They'd give like a, you know, 100 or 200 hertz uh, shock to that pathway. And then they look to see what happens to those synapses within the dentate gyrus. So one of the, hyp the hypotheses is, well, if you want synapses to be stronger, what if you work them really hard real quick? And so what happens is, if you look at the responses of those synapses before the tetanic stimulation, you see that there's this dip. There's a, this is the synaptic response down here. So low means, means that it's a, it's a, that's the response. Uh, it's, it's depolarization. And after the tetanic stimulation, what they found was there was an increase in the amount of depolarization they saw within, um, within, those, within those synaptic fields. And so what was interesting about this was that it didn't just happen for seconds, as has been shown before. This lasted for hours, uh, which then became, uh, it became interesting to people for two reasons. One, now it's long term. It didn't just last for a few minutes. It lasted for hours and sometimes days. And it also occurred in a brain area uh, that was involved in, uh, in memory. So the way those stimulation, exp those stimulation experiments work were, uh, so this, they establish a baseline, so they go pop, 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 pop at a set level of current. They blast the, um, the cells with high intensity simulation, 
And then they go back after they give that same test pulse. And what you see is that at 50 hertz, high intensity, you see this um, synaptic potentiation. So the synapses are, are much stronger than they were uh, prior to, uh, prior to, to uh, the titanic simulation. What's interesting is if you give them low levels of stimulation, so 5 hertz, the opposite happens. So the synapses actually become weaker. So one's called long-term potentiation and the other one's called long-term depression. And it allows the brain the ability to modulate synaptic strength, either up or down, not just, not just up. It gives it some more computational, computational power. And the reason why this was so exciting at the time is because uh, you know, a few years earlier they discovered that the hippocampus was uh, involved in memory. So a very, very famous patient had epilepsy and had a hippocampal resection. And so in the normal brain, this is the hippocampus. It sits like a cashew nut that rolls back inside the temporal, the uh, medial temporal lobe. Uh, and you can see it shown here in these green dots. It's down here in the temporal lobe. Uh, and HM, they went in and because of his severe epilepsy uh, and the medications weren't working anymore. They took out a portion of his hippocampus and amygdala as it turned out. And he had profound antrograde amnesia for the rest of his life. He could remember things before the surgery, but not after. It was probably the most studied, uh, neuropsychologically studied patient in the world. He died in uh, 2008. The surgery was done in uh, 1953, I believe. Um, he spent much of the time living at MIT and other, other hospitals where they studied him extensively to find out what exactly kind of memory impairments he had. But LTP was discovered, or, or not discovered, but shown in this brain area. So now plasticity and memory became linked. And that, that's important for rehabilitation because whether it's motor, memory or uh, cognitive sorts of memory, it's important that plasticity is associated with those things was being demonstrated back in the, in the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, you can use the same model of simulation where you provide um, single bursts of, of titanic simulation. If you give them five low levels of simulation across five days versus one high level, so the same total amount of simulation, but more repetitions, just one intense uh, bout here, you see more potentiation. So repetition is also important. So it's not just the behavioral signals, like intensity and repetition, but also uh, it's also important for um, neurophys or neurophysiological stimulation. Uh, and just to convince you this isn't a rat or a rabbit specific phenomena, so um, the NIH spent half a trillion dollars on this research up until you know, 2005, I think was when I, I calculated that number. Um, you can also see it in the human cortex. So that video that I showed you with the TMS paddle with the fan on it, so instead of giving a single pulse, you're giving somebody um, 20 pulses per second. And if you give somebody 20 pulses per second for you know, five minutes on, five minutes off, uh, you do that over a period of time, it's almost like giving the same blast of stimulation to the rabbit hippocampus, but now it's a human hippocampus. And instead of measuring synaptic changes, you're measuring motor evoke potentials in the muscle. What you can see is that before the RTMS, the repetitive simulation, the titanic simulation, and after, you see that you get a larger response to the same, the same level of stimulation prior to the, prior to the titanic simulation. So it also occurs in, in the human, human cortex. And uh, th the same phenomena applies where low frequency stimulation, so one hertz in people, reduces cortical excitability, and 20 hertz stimulation increases excitability. Now this may not sound all that exciting to you right now, but this is a technique that's being used in stroke rehabilitation to try and increase the excitability of brain areas that are still intact uh, but may have been quieted down by the stroke. So giving them t um, uh, high frequency stimulation to try and increase the excitability of those brain areas to get them more engaged in uh, rehabilitation. So we'll talk about that uh, in the next lecture. And timing, you can also show this neurophysiologically. So I showed you that uh, under using TMS, you send a pulse down through the, the TMS paddle, goes down through the spinal cord, creates a, uh, a motor evoke potential. You can take that pulse and you can pair it with stimulation of uh, the median nerve, for example. So you stimulate the median nerve about 25 milliseconds before you send a pulse through uh, the TMS paddle. And they meet in the cortex at exactly the same time. And you do this five or 600 times. Um, and what you find is that the um, MEP that you see, that's a result of that stimulation, is larger after that pairing than it is before. Then you can just go back and say, okay, I've paired it. What does it look like now compared to when it was unpaired prior to the, the, the repeated pairing? And what you find is that the MEP still looks uh, larger than it did prior to the, the pairing. So there's a whole field of the timing of neural, uh, neural activity that's important. It's just one example to show you that a lot of the behavioral signals, timing, repetition, intensity, are also shown in uh, neurophysiologically.
Uh, no, the reason, the reason the timing works is that um, the sensory information comes up from the median nerve, goes through the somatosensory cortex, and it meets in the motor cortex at exactly the same time that the TMS pulse arrives. So they arrive together, and that timed response makes the synapses that the TMS was simulating stronger. So that, repulse, that pulse gets stronger. And this technique is also being used in the treatment for traumatic brain injury and stroke by trying to get more uh, synaptic excitability to occur within the brain by pairing sensory stimulation with uh, TMS stimulation. So we'll talk more about that uh, in the next lecture. Okay, the last uh, growth, the, the last neural signaling system I want to talk about is something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's called BDNF. I like to call it the miracle growth of the brain. Uh, it's the most abundant growth factor that's found in the brain. Uh, it's involved in sustaining neural growth, promoting synaptic plasticity, angiogenesis. Wonderful stuff for the brain for the most part. Um, and if you take BDNF and without doing anything else to the brain, just take it and squirt it onto a brain area such as the hippocampus, you can induce synaptic potentiation. So normally you see these curves in response to high frequency stimulation. In this experiment, all they're doing is they're taking BDNF in a pipette and they're squirting it into a recording area and then they stimulate at a normal level and what you can see is there's an increase in synaptic strength. We'll talk more about that later because it turns out that BDNF has been a growth factor that's been the subject of a lot of attention for, for promoting functional improvement after stroke or brain injury or Parkinson's disease. Uh, lots of work are being done and some genetic work that I'll, I'll tell you about um, in the next lecture. Okay, so uh, just some review questions from the last portion of the lecture. Uh, the first one is, what are the basic elements of neural signaling? What is LTP? And what elements of neural activity uh, drive plasticity? And what is BDNF? Okay, so uh, we're going to continue on. What I'm hoping that you took away from this lecture, and we're getting ready for uh, the second lecture, is that behavioral signals drive neural signals, which orchestrate plasticity, which in turn um, cause changes in, in function, uh, functional improvement in the, case of, in the context of neural rehabilitation. Um, so the next lecture, we're going to talk about what is the actual evidence. So I've told you all about plasticity, but what's the actual evidence that it does support functional improvement? Um, what's the difference between recovery and compensation? This will be an interesting discussion because uh, neuroscientists and, and clinicians use these words very differently, I'm talking about at a neural versus behavioral level, and it's important, I think, that physical therapists um, uh, especially understand the difference between those two. Um, are there key therapies that drive the behavioral signals we talked about? Um, are there some new ad, um, ad, adjuvant therapies that are out there that drive neural signals? Uh, and finally, we're going to talk about uh, an emerging field, which I'm, I'm really excited about, is uh, biomarkers. Can you predict the capacity of the brain or can you use information about the anatomy and the connectivity of the brain to guide the types of therapies um, that, that you're delivering um, within the clinic? So I'd be happy to answer um, any of your questions.